Hello there and welcome to a new edition of Eco at Africa. I am Nel Taigbe in Lagos. Today, we're talking about countries that you don't hear much about on the show, countries like Gambia and Somalia. And of course, I'm not alone on the show. My colleague Sharon is in Kenya. Hello there, Sharon. Hello, Neota, and hello, everybody. My name is Sharon Momani in Nairobi, Kenya, and I can tell from here that you're just as excited as I am about the next 26 minutes packed with environmental stories that are brought to you by DW, KTN, and Channels TV. Here's what's coming up. We show you a community-based nature conservancy in Kenya. How a female-run initiative is trying to protect mangroves in Gambia. And why animals in Egypt should be treated better. We start the show in one of the poorest regions of the world. In Somaliland, almost 70% of the population are still living as nomads. Electricity is a luxury that many of them there don't have, and that includes lighting. But one man is trying to change that. He invented solar lights, and now even the poorest can afford them. Daib Noor is herding his camels back into the pen for night shelter. Like all Somali nomads over the centuries, he used to fear the dark. At night, his precious camels were under constant threat from predators like hyenas. He often had to fear for his own life too. We used to have a lot of problems. We used handheld flashlights at night, but we had difficulties finding batteries. And during those times, we would be attacked by hyenas. Now, thanks to these solar lamps, any potential predators are scared away by the bright lights. And the camels have something interesting to investigate. Hargeisa is the capital of Somaliland. Here, Abdi Shakur Ahmed has set up his own solar company to bring light to the rural areas. As a child, he was a refugee and grew up in poverty. He was only introduced to electric light at the age of 11. Today, he and his team are on a mission to replace traditional kerosene and battery-powered lamps with solar power. Rural Somalis spend one quarter of their income to light their houses with kerosene, which is more expensive than the total cost of solar light. So we have introduced a financing model which enables them to, bear, to buy solar products on installment and it utilizes mobile money technology. At 50 cents a day, it is affordable even for people in rural areas. Every week, Abdi Shakur and his team head out to remote areas. They travel rough roads to bring sustainable and clean lighting to completely neglected communities. These trips, however, have their fair share of challenges. We have trips twice a week and go to rural communities. Sometimes we go to like a very remote areas. And some of the challenges we actually have is like a lack of road accessibility to those areas. There are no roads exist sometimes in the areas that we drive. And sometimes the team get lost in, in the middle of nowhere. In the middle of nowhere, close to Somaliland's border with Ethiopia, we come to the small village of Tuli. Here, it is already normal to see some light solar lamps in the few shops and homes. Rama Mihile, who runs a small business, was one of the first to buy the clean and durable lighting alternative. In the past, we used to use kerosene lamps, but we've switched to solar light as it allows us to stay open late at night. Now, nighttime or daytime, it doesn't make any difference. We can continue with our work. The shop owner has connected more and more people who are interested in knowing more about the solar lamps. Kerosene lamps are not only expensive and environmentally harmful, they also pose a real risk of fire breaking out in the middle of the night. After four months, the solar lamps are paid off, a concept that works. Since 2014, we've sold over 5,000 solar lamps and have reached over 85 villages. Our customers here are usually small business owners and households, as well as nomads and farmers who need the lights for protection. Most of our clients, about 65%, are women. 
One of the reasons that the rural Somali market has been so neglected is that many people cannot afford much. Many locals still survive by battering, hunting or small-scale farming. That's why Abdi Shakur came up with alternative payment solutions. All of our customers don't usually have cash ready. Uh, sometimes they might have other commodities that are you know, acceptable, such as agricultural products, livestock or chicken egg. So if they have you know, a, a commodities like that, we actually accept it as payment. Many people can now afford the lamps, a development that's good for the environment and useful to local residents. On the night market, for example, small light is making a big difference. Why should locals protect the wildlife? Maybe they feel there's no need, especially when animals like giraffes and elephants destroy the farmer's harvest. It can cause conflict, for instance, in Kenya, which happens. But steps are being taken to stop this from happening. For instance, at the All Kenya Conservancy close to Masai Mara. Let's take a look. Sunrise in southwestern Kenya. After their morning drive at Old Kenya Conservancy, Pauline and Noel Zinsley settle down for breakfast in the wild. This is the last day of safari for the couple from New Zealand. The highlight here with the camp is the food, oh. and we're going camping, so we're taking picnic. Um, oh, breakfast yeah, yeah. with us and so um, it's all packed ready for us we go out um, we, we find a lovely location we sit there on the other side of the camp Simon Koiti and his team of rangers keep watch Simon has worked as a senior warden for three and a half years now but still has to convince the locals that protecting the environment is important. When I talk about environmental security, so that people don't cut trees down, don't cause fires and wildlife, you know, um, so that they become the white dogs of, uh, on behalf of the community and on behalf of the government. Simon benefits from the partnership between locals and two safari companies. In this partnership, members of the neighboring Maasai community lease out more than 7,500 hectares of land to the safari companies. They receive a monthly payment depending on the number of acres they have leased. When land was subdivided into individual land ownership, then people together came and, and signed lease with, with the company you know, to form a conservancy. People now are more settled and now they, they will not move mainly their livestock um, because, you know, they have, they have more other land outside the conservancy and they get money from the conservancy. So they guarantee income and they're happy. Today, there are almost 200 landowners leasing their land, which makes a big difference. The area now has over 20 lions, as well as cheetahs, leopards, a host of birds, gazelles, caped buffaloes and many others. In addition to the income from leasing their land, the community also offers activities for the tourists. <laughs> Local residents have also set up enclosures to protect their livestock from wild animals. They call them lion boma. Kantet Ole Paro and his son Kakue Paro have one. They have over 500 animals. In the past, we used to have a lot of problems with wild animals attacking our livestock. Lions would attack and kill our cows and goats. But since we got the boma, there are no lions or hyenas attacking our animals anymore. But not everything is rosy. Having fenced-in enclosures within the protected area poses a problem, as the senior warden explains. Several um, problems caused by the fences. One, it blocks the wildlife corridor, the normal migratory route. That is one of the challenges. Secondly, it traps wildlife. When they try to jump over, 
they are en entangled inside the fences. And that caused conflict. The Conservancy Management argues that the government needs to engage more with locals by providing compensation for attacks on their livestock and more suitable protection measures. If the locals care for the wild animals, they will attract more tourists like the ones from New Zealand. And in the end, everyone will benefit, locals, the tourists, the wildlife and the environment.